Well, please open your Bible at the end of Mark 4 that has been read to us. We're continuing our one-year journey through the whole Bible story, and this is week number 31. Um, We are seeing that the whole Bible is one story, and that it is all about Jesus Christ. He really is the center. He is the focus of the entire Bible story. Jesus speaks about this Himself. On one occasion, He said, the Scriptures bear witness about Me. The whole of the Bible, the whole of the Scripture bears witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was growing up in Sunday school, Edinburgh, Scotland, we learned uh, a little phrase that I think is quite helpful about the Old and the New Testament and how they're joined together. And it goes like this, the new is in the old concealed, and the old is in the new revealed. In other words, everything that's in the New Testament is actually anticipated in the Old Testament. The new is in the old concealed. But also, the old is in the new revealed. You cannot fully understand the Old Testament Scriptures without the New Testament Scriptures. The Old Testament is about God's promises being made. The New Testament is about God's promises being kept. And so, when we come to the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension and the promise of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are at the very center of the Bible story. It is all about Him. So, I'm delighted that you're here as we come to the very center of the Bible, as we come to the story of the Gospels. We looked a couple of weeks ago at how Jesus Christ was born into the world. He was born of a virgin, In other words, He didn't arise from the human race. He came to the human race. God became a man in Christ Jesus. The Word became flesh and lived among us. The angel said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the child to be born will be called holy, a child born who's holy. That was something entirely new in the entire history of the world. This had never happened before. Up until the time of Jesus, what was born was not holy, and what was holy was not born until Jesus Christ came into the world, and the Holy One is born of the Virgin Mary. Then we saw last week how our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy One, was tempted. No one has ever been tempted to the degree that Jesus Christ was tempted. And I say that for this reason, that He is the only person in all of human history who has ever felt the full force of Satan's power. Let me try and illustrate this for you very simply. Imagine three airmen, and they're flying jets over enemy territory during a war, and they're shot down, and they're captured, and then they're taken by the enemy for interrogation. One by one, they are brought into a darkened room. The first airman gives his name and his rank and his serial number, and they begin to press him for information that he knows he should not give. But he also knows that the enemy is cruel, and eventually they'll break him. And so, why go through all of that? So, he tells them what they want to know. They bring in the second airman. And he gives his name and his rank and his serial number, and they begin to pump him for information. He's determined not to give in. So, the cruelty begins. And eventually, it overwhelms him, and he breaks, and he tells them what they want to know. Then a third airman comes in, and he gives his name and his rank and his serial number, and he says to them, you will not break me. Oh, yes, we will. 
they say. We have broken every man who's ever come into this room. You'll see. And so the cruelty begins, and he does not break. The cruelty intensifies, and he still does not break. It intensifies again until it becomes unbearable, and still he does not break. Finally, there comes a point where they have thrown at him everything that they know, and they are exhausted. He's not like any other person who has ever come into this room, they said. We cannot break him. Now, just ask this question. Which of these three airmen faced the full force of the enemy? The only one who knew the full force of everything that the enemy had to throw was the one who did not break. And so, don't ever think that Jesus Christ's temptations were less than yours. Only Christ knows the full power of temptation because only Christ has withstood the full force of the enemy's assault. Now, that's where we've got in the Bible story is Jesus Christ is being introduced to us, born, tempted, and what we're going to see today is that Jesus Christ is indeed God with us, and what that means is that He is sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you turn back just a moment to um, Mark and chapter 1, a couple of chapters earlier, you will see what happened immediately after the temptations of Jesus. Verse 13 of Mark chapter 1 tells us that He was tempted in the wilderness, and then verse 14 of chapter 1 we read that Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So, Jesus comes, beginning His public ministry after His temptations and His triumph over the enemy. He comes proclaiming the gospel of God. Uh, the word gospel, of course, very simply means good news. So, what is the good news that Jesus is proclaiming? The good news He proclaims, we're told, is that the kingdom of God is at hand. A kingdom means that there is a king, that there is a ruler, and the good news is that the king himself has come, that the kingdom is at hand, that it is near, that it is about to unfold. And what we're going to look at today in Mark chapter 4 and in Mark chapter 5 are four stories that unveil Jesus as the sovereign Lord, the King of kings. I want us to see these four stories, and then we're going to make three observations about them that will show how they speak directly into our lives and into our world today. So, back to Mark in chapter 4, please, if you would. Jesus is sovereign Lord, we are told here first, in relation to disasters. That's Mark chapter 4 and verse 34 to 41. On that day, verse 35, when evening had come, He said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took Him with them in the boat just as He was. Now, notice what's happening here. Jesus is leading the disciples into a storm. Now, we're familiar, of course, with the story of Jonah, where he got into a storm because he disobeyed the Lord. But what we have here is the disciples being obedient to the Lord Jesus, and He leads them into a storm. They are in difficulty because they are doing what Christ tells them. Let us go across to the other side of the lake. And notice what happens, verse 37, a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Always remember this, that Jesus never promises to any of us a storm-free life. In this world, Jesus says, you will have trouble. 
In the Acts of the Apostles, we read these words, that it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. And notice that when trouble comes, the instinctive reaction of these disciples is to think, well, Jesus mustn't really care about us. How like us that is, isn't it? The first reaction, look at it, verse 38, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And we read that he awoke and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Karen and I uh, watched a program this week in the American Experience uh, series on PBS. It was on Woodstock, uh, the rock concert that captured the spirit of a generation. Now, can you believe it? 50 years ago, 400,000 people gathered for three days. And on the third day, dark clouds gathered, and it was very clear that a, a major storm was brewing. And as the darkness was beginning to encircle, someone grabbed the microphone on the stage at Woodstock and started shouting, no rain, no rain, no rain, no rain. Then they got 400,000 people involved no rain, no rain, no rain, until the heavens opened and they all got drenched. <laughs> the human spirit does not have power over the elements. We do not have power over the rain. We do not have power over the flood. We do not have power over the wildfire or the tornado or the mudslide or the volcano or the tsunami, but when Jesus rebuked the wind, the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Jesus is the sovereign Lord. Second, Jesus is the sovereign Lord not only over disasters, which that certainly would have been apart from His command, but He is the sovereign Lord over demons chapter 5 and the first 20 verses, we have here the story of a man with an unclean spirit. That's Mark chapter 5 and verse 2. Somehow, the power of Satan had entered into the life of this man and got a hold of him, and this man simply could not get free. And if you look at verse 5 of Mark 5, you'll see there that night and day, he was among the tombs and on the mountains, and he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. So, here is a person in an awful state of disturbance and of distress. Jesus described the devil as a thief who comes to steal and kill and destroy. And there is not necessarily direct demonic activity involved in every incidence of stealing or killing or destroying, but where stealing, killing, and destroying are most rampant, there Satan's activity is rightly discerned. Now, this man, and think about how this speaks to us today, brothers and sisters, this man was a threat, and he was an absolute terror to the entire community in which he lived. The local authorities had tried to restrain him. They had put him in chains. Verse 4, when they put him in chains, oh, we've got the solution now. We'll just lock him up. We'll bind him up. And what happened was that he wrenched the chains apart, verse 4, and he broke the shackles in pieces. The whole community lived in fear. The authorities are not able to stop this. Why can't the authorities stop this? And here's this man, and he's 
a threat looming over the community, and he's out in the hills among the tombs crying out at night. Must have been hard to sleep. And notice the comment in verse 4, no one had the strength to subdue him. When Jesus came to that place, he commanded the evil spirits to leave this man, and they left. And when the people from the town heard what had happened, they came out and they found, verse 15, the man who had been possessed by these evil spirits, and he was sitting, and he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. An absolute transformation. Jesus is being revealed here as the sovereign Lord. He's Lord over disasters. Even the winds and the waves have to obey Him. And He's sovereign over the demons. They have to obey Him too. Third, He is the sovereign Lord over disease. And here we have a third story in which Mark tells us about a woman who had suffered from debilitating illness for no less than 12 years. In chapter 5 and verse 26, we're told that she had spent all of her money on various doctors, but in spite of their efforts, her condition was no better. Verse 26, she had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Uh, evidently, medical treatment was very expensive in those days, uh, as it still is today. Now, thank God for doctors, amen? And for every accomplishment and advance that has been made in our lifetime in regards to medical science. I was speaking, though, to a woman who was new to our church just a few weeks ago, out in the foyer after service, and asking her what she did, and she said, uh, I, I'm a nurse, and I spent my career largely in the intensive care unit, and uh, as I asked her a little more, I was thanking her for her work, speaking about its value and its importance, and she listened politely, and then she said, yes, but in the end, we have a 100% failure rate at some point in every life, there is a place where there is nothing more that the doctors can do. That was a very striking comment to come from her. And that was the position that this woman was in. Nothing more that the doctors could do. But she felt that Jesus would be able to help her if she could just reach Jesus, if she could just touch even His clothing, and she did. And we're told, verse 29, that when she touched his clothing, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. In verse 34, Jesus said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Jesus is the sovereign Lord. Do you see the pattern here? Four stories all being uh, strung together in Mark's gospel. He's a sovereign Lord over um, disaster, over the demons. Now we see His authority in regards to disease. And, and then fourthly, Mark records this remarkable story of the authority of the sovereign Lord over death itself. Jesus came to a home where there had been a great tragedy. A 12-year-old girl had died, and the grieving was already in process. The wake had begun, and when Jesus arrived, He sends all of the mourners out of the house so that only the girl's father and mother and three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, remained in the house. And then the Scripture tells us that Jesus took the hand of the dead girl, and he said, 
Talitha Kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, rise up. And to the absolute amazement of everyone in the room, the little girl got up, and the scripture says she began walking. For anyone who has lost a loved one, I think the pattern of this story is beautiful and profound. This daughter of Jairus, that was her father's name, had become very ill. And Jairus had gone to speak to Jesus and to ask for his help. And Jesus was already, Mark tells us, on his way to come to the house, but there was a delay. And the delay came about because this woman who had suffered so much and the doctors weren't able to do anything for her, uh, she had approached the Lord Jesus and Jesus had stopped to minister to her. And during that time in which Jesus was delayed, the message then came to Jairus that the little girl had died. And so Jesus was not to be bothered anymore, but Jesus came anyway and, and took her hand and raised her up. Do you see the pattern of this story? To everyone who has lost a loved one, this story says, in this world, there will be death, there will be a delay, and there will be a resurrection. And that resurrection will come when the Lord Jesus Christ himself arrives in all of his power and in all of his glory. Now, these two stories that clearly are making a single point in regards to who Jesus is that is of supreme importance, he's the sovereign Lord, they're all brought together so that we see in quick succession he's the sovereign Lord in relation to disaster, in relation to demons, in relation to disease, and even in relation to death itself. Now, three observations by way of application from these stories. And the first is this, and it's really important. I want you to see it and to find great joy in it that Jesus saves precisely because He is the Sovereign Lord. Jesus saves because He is the Sovereign Lord. He's not the Sovereign Lord, He's not able to save, but because He is the Sovereign Lord, that is why He is able to save. Now, I stress this here because one of the most damaging misunderstandings of the gospel is the idea that some people seem to pick up that somehow you can have Jesus as your Savior and avoid Him as your Lord, as if you could somehow receive what He offers and at the same time just ignore what He commands. You hear it from people from time to time, oh yes, I trusted Jesus as my Savior, but I never made Him my Lord. What in the world does that mean? The assumption, of course, is that somehow we have the right and the freedom and the ability to separate the Savior from the Lord, that we can therefore have faith without repentance, justification without sanctification, forgiveness of sins without the pursuit of holiness. That is a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel. Jesus is presented to us as the sovereign Lord who saves, and He saves precisely because He is the sovereign Lord. It's the fact that He's Lord that qualifies Jesus uniquely to be our Savior. Let me give you a little illustration that will always stay with me from my childhood. When I was a small boy, my father took me on a number of occasions to a, a junkyard where there were scrap cars. Um, it was a marvelous place for a child with a vivid imagination to play. And my dad used to go there from time to time in order to get spare parts that were needed for our, our very old car that 
remarkably, he managed to keep running by this means. The, simple, the system there in the junkyard was very, very simple, that you could go in, strip pieces that were needed off these uh, wrecked cars, and uh, then pay for them uh, at the gate on the way out, except that there was one problem. Some people had got evidently into the habit of taking pieces off the cars, throwing them over the fence, walking out paying for nothing, and then going around and picking up the stuff outside afterwards. So, they had cleared a no-go area around the perimeter fence of this large yard. And they had run a railing all the way around, and they had brought in guard dogs. And they had leashed the dogs to the railing so that as long as you did not go within about six feet of the railing, you were perfectly safe. And I will never forget as a small boy having found some wrecked truck that I had climbed up into and was enjoying the imaginary world of truck driving, which I still find absolutely fascinating to contemplate. And I will never forget seeing out of the corner of my eye, one of these dogs broke free from the leash. And it came charging towards me, and I was absolutely terrified. And I remember my father was working under the hood of a car, and he saw what was happening, and he grabbed a stick, and he fended off the dog, and he saved me by subduing the dog. If you can't subdue the dog, you can't save the boy. The Lordship of Jesus Christ is good news. It's good news because Jesus is able to save us from our enemies precisely because He has the power to be sovereign over them. It's the fact that Jesus is Lord that qualifies Him to be, act as Savior, and He is able to be our Savior precisely because He has the authority of the Lord. That is why the New Testament says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If not Lord, He can't save. That's why at the orchard we like to summarize the gospel, the good news, in four words. And what's the first? Lord, sin, Savior, and faith. The good news is that there is a sovereign Lord who is able to deliver us from all of our greatest enemies. And if He was not Lord, He could not be Savior. Christ invites us to enter into His kingdom and to live under the blessing of His rule. Friends, there is so much more to the gospel than a kind of get-out-of-jail-free card, as it were, for people who believe in Jesus. No, He's going to bring us into all of the riches that come from His sovereign rule, and He's Savior precisely because He is Lord. Second observation by way of application of this very, very important truth that is at the heart of the Bible. Our world aches because it rejects the sovereign Lord. Chapter 5 and verse 17, when Jesus had delivered the demon-possessed man and the people came out, and they saw him utterly transformed, the biggest threat to the community, sitting, dressed, and in his right mind. And their response was, chapter 5, verse 17, they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Please go away. You would think you would think that they might have said, you have solved the biggest social problem we have in this community. Will you stay for another two weeks because we can give you another 10 problems 
And if you can deal with this, you can deal with them too. Wouldn't you think they'd say that? But that's not the reaction. That's not the response of our world to the sovereign king. Our world sees the sovereign Lord and says, whoa, 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 whoa. And what you see here in them asking him to go, of course, works itself out as you follow the gospel story in the rejection of Jesus that ultimately was expressed at the cross. God sends His Son into the world, the Sovereign Lord. The Word becomes flesh, and we reject the Lord of glory. We mock Him. We spit on Him. and We nail Him to a cross. And a world that rejects the Sovereign Lord is a world that continues to experience the darkness, the agony, the aching of disasters and demons and disease and death. If the only one who can subdue the dog is evicted from the junkyard, what will happen to the boy? In order to understand the world in which we live, you have to take in this statement from John's gospel that He, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. Now, notice two things at this point that are very important. One is that while Jesus did indeed leave when He was asked to leave, He did not leave these people in total darkness. Look at verse 17 of chapter 5. They began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Now here, this is just a, a reflection of our own culture, isn't it? We, we, we don't want the claims of the sovereign Lord, you see. And so, what happens? Jesus gets into the boat, and as He does, the man who had been possessed with demons begged Him that He might be with Him. Here's this man who now is a disciple of Jesus, and He says, well, let me come with you. And Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends. That's friends who don't want Jesus in their community. You go home to your friends, and you tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how He has had mercy on you. And he, that's the man, went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, for him and everyone marveled. You see, that's exactly the position that we are in. We live in a Christ-rejecting world, but Christ has not left that world without a witness. Why are we here? Our destiny is to be in heaven. Why are we here? The same reason as that man was left by Jesus there. There is a community that rejects Jesus, and there are people who desperately need to know what He has done for you. And this is not the end of the Bible story either. The same Jesus who was crucified and utterly rejected rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, where the Father said to him, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13, sit at my right hand until, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And those who belong to Christ's kingdom those who own Him as sovereign Lord and trust Him therefore as Savior, we wait for the day when Jesus will put all His enemies under His feet, when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And under His blessed rule, there will be no more disaster and no more demons, and no more disease, and no more death. And when that day comes, God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. The last thing I want to say very briefly today is simply this. 
that peace grows as you submit to the sovereign Lord. Peace grows as you submit to the sovereign Lord. As we've looked at these three stories, I wonder if you have noticed that peace always follows the lordship of Jesus being unveiled. To the storm, Jesus says, peace, be still. And this water that's in a great convulsion suddenly is calmed. And then this man who has been distraught, he's been cutting himself. He's been crying out, wandering around among tombs. And Christ brings him to peace and to order. He's sitting clothed and in his right mind. To the woman who suffered for years and the doctors couldn't do any more for her, Jesus says, go in peace and be healed of your disease. Have peace. Every time the sovereign lordship of Christ is revealed, peace follows. And when Jesus comes into this chaotic home with all of these mourners wailing and wailing, when he leaves, peace has been restored. Where Christ reigns, peace always follows. Where Christ reigns, peace always follows. And we have these two things brought together in perhaps one of the best-known verses that's often quoted in the Christmas story. You remember from Isaiah in chapter 9, we have this remarkable statement of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Do you see the connection there? Here's what this means. The way to know greater peace in your life is to submit yourself more fully to the government and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Is there someone here today, and in your soul you are torn apart? There's something you want, and you don't have it. There's something you've lost, and you can't get it back. There's only one way to peace for you. And here's what it is. You submit your hopes, and your dreams, and your desires, and your fears, and your needs. You submit it all to the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ, and you say, Lord, your will be done. Learn to say, Lord, your will be done. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And the more you submit your life to the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ, the greater the peace that you will enjoy. Father, we bless you today for our sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. And gladly and humbly, as best we know how, would embrace him in faith and in repentance, submitting ourselves to him, that we may be his, his servants, his alone, his forever. Hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.